this is Colleen, and I would love to invite you to be part of our Central Cares Project to bless Shining Like Homes. They are a ministry located right here off of High Street in Portsmouth, and they help 18 to 25 year old women who have gotten into some kind of struggle or, um, or dif difficulty. And I recently had the opportunity to sit down with the founder, Patty Johnson, and found out some ways that we can bless her and her office. She needs us to help paint. She needs us to help clean and organize some of the donations that they have received and we're going to do that friday march 25th in the evening probably starting around six o'clock or so but if you have another opportunity throughout the week during the day she would love to have that help as well so i invite you to sign up and help us and if you can't uh, make that opportunity available sign up for another project that suits your needs thank you so much that's right central cares is right around the corner we kick off our first project this Wednesday, and then all of the others are just two weeks away. So make sure to sign up right now to get in on all of the action. This really is where we press into living lives that resemble Jesus. When we can get out among the people of our community, see them and love them. So let's join together to do something memorable and impactful. And mark your calendars for the afternoon of Saturday, March 26 at 3 p.m. We'll have spent the early part of the day in a range of different Central Cares projects, and then we'll gather back at the Portsmouth City Park Playground to regroup, talk about everything that happened, celebrate, and give away Rick's frozen custard to our neighbors who are there in the park too. If you're new with us today, thanks for joining us. We'd love to get to know you better and help you connect with God and people through Central. You can help us do that by sending us a communication card with your best contact info. If you provide an email address, then we'll send you our weekly email that covers the big things that are happening in our community. And you can also use the communication card to ask us to pray about something for you. The electronic communication card is at discovercentral.info. Well, today is the first Sunday of our Missions Month, and throughout the month, we'll bring you updates from several of our missionaries. We currently have nearly 60 missionaries and organizations that we support as they strengthen churches and make disciples throughout the world. But our fund to support these causes has dwindled slowly over the last several years. In order to continue supporting the commitments we've made, while we also desire to support someone else when the opportunity arises, we're going to need to boost the resources we have available for missions. So how would God have you be involved in investing in the spread of the gospel through our missionaries? There is no other investment that can provide a return like this one. Please pray and ask God what you can give above and beyond your normal offering to Central so that we can continue to support these laborers who have chosen to go where we can't or won't go. When we all do a little, together we can do a lot. And, you know, one of the main reasons that we give generously is because of our deep gratitude to and fervent worship of Jesus. So let's enjoy his presence now.
St. Patrick's Day is only a couple of weeks away, and when we think of St. Patrick's Day, the country that we often think of is Ireland, right? We think of Ireland. But did you know that Patrick wasn't from Ireland at all? No, in fact, his is a remarkable story. I want to share it with you this morning. Patrick, he was actually from Britain, and he was from this well-to-do family. His grandfather was actually a pastor. But when Patrick was 16 years old, a group of barbarians invaded his village, and they kidnapped Patrick. Patrick, he tried to remember where they were taking him, but they took him on a long journey. They hopped in a boat, and they made it all the way to Ireland. It was there that Patrick was sold as a slave and his master told him hey if you ever try to escape if you ever try to run it's going to be terrible for you might even put you to death the man who oversaw the slaves there he uh, kind of taunted Patrick a little bit when he heard about his story and asked him where his God was and if his God was so strong how come he couldn't protect him and things like this well it was through those taunts that Patrick actually began to pray and to seek this God that he had always Always turned away from his that God was always his parents God his grandfather's God but it was never his well through this experience he began to pray to the point where the other slaves called him holy boy well for six long difficult hard years Patrick was a slave but as he was praying he began to have these dreams dreams of God leading him to freedom and then one night, six years later, when Patrick was 22, he had this dream of God leading him to freedom, telling him to get up right now and go. And so that's exactly what Patrick did. He got up in the middle of the night and he escaped. He made sure not to take any of the main roads. He went through thick brush and all kinds of difficult terrain. And eventually he made it to the port. And while he was at the port, he stood at a distance and he just surveyed the captains and the different ships and everything until he finally spotted one he thought he could talk to and he approached this captain and he asked the captain hey could I work for my safe passage back to Britain at first the captain said no and then some of the other guys said hey we actually are down some hands we could really use the help and so the captain called him back and said yeah come on board that's exactly what Patrick did he got on board he worked for his passage made it back to Britain and made it to his house over six years later he finally returned home and he told his family about all his experiences and most importantly he told his family about his newfound faith a faith that was his family's but was never his own now it was his own and he, as he's telling them this, he's continuing to pray. Well, two years later, two years after being home in Britain, he felt that God was telling him to get up and go again, to go back to Ireland. And that's exactly what Patrick did. He went back to Ireland as a missionary, the first missionary to Ireland in 432 AD. And when he was there, he planted churches. He established schools and training grounds for pastors. He discipled many Irish people until he died 29 years later. That's the incredible story of Patrick. Now, if you were Patrick, would you have wanted to go back to that place? Place. I mean, back to that place where you were sold as into slavery and treated so horribly. Would you ever want to go back there? And if you did, how would you start that conversation? How would that conversation begin to take shape? You know, that's the question we often deal with, isn't it? How do we start a conversation? It doesn't matter what the conversation is. When you're starting a conversation with somebody, how does it begin? And so, you know, you go into an interview. You only have one chance to make a first impression. What are your first words going to be? What are your first phrases? How do you start the conversation? There's a young guy. He sees a young lady. He wants to make a good first impression, but he has to, how do I start this conversation? How do I approach her? What do I say? What, what word should I? use how do you start the question how do you start the conversation how do you start a conversation with God what questions would you ask him what what things would you want to tell him you know, this morning we're starting a new conversation, a new series. It's a, it's a series that will take us all the way up till Easter because this is missions month for us here at Central. And so we're, we're looking at different missionaries and looking at our missionary calling. And as we do that, we begin our first conversation this morning, these conversations that Jesus had from the cross.
You know, throughout church history, Jesus had seven conversations from the cross, and it's these seven conversations that the church has come back to time and time again for a point of thought, a point of emphasis, a point of meditation, to discover just what is Jesus saying from the cross, what does it mean, and what do you think Jesus' first words from the cross would be? Well, what do you think he would say first? Do you think he would call out the people who are standing there? Do you think he would say, so? what, what would your first words be? It's interesting. The first words from the cross, the first conversation that Jesus has, it's the word forgiven. Forgiven. Uh, it's a scandalous truth that we can hardly grasp hold of, the fact that we truly are forgiven. Let's take a look at it this morning because it's a fact we all need to be reminded of. It's in Luke chapter 23 verse 34 and Jesus says this and Jesus said, Father forgive them for they do not know what they do and they cast lots for his garments. Father forgive them for they do not know what they do. We're launching into this series, the series of seven words, seven conversations, seven statements that Jesus made from the cross. Many of these statements, many of these conversation starters, oh, you're going to know them by heart if you go through this series with us. And one of the things you should know is seven is the number of perfection in the Bible. It's often used when things are just right. Uh, four corners of the earth, three persons of the Trinity, seven. It's this summary of all of earth in all of heaven. It's just this perfect number. And in seven conversations, Jesus is going to say everything that needs to be said from the cross. And he is speaking from the cross. It was a brutal way to die. You know, it was the most brutal, human, uh, dehumanizing, humiliating way to die. So much so that it was actually against the law to crucify a Roman citizen. It was, it was too hor horrific for them. So you wouldn't do that to them. Maybe you remember Paul when Paul was in jail in the Philippian jail in Philippi. He was... He, he was tortured, he was whipped, he was beaten, and then they found out he was a Roman citizen. And so some of them were backing away. They, they didn't want to uh, be found out that they were a part of this beating because that's not how you treated a Roman citizen. And crucifixion, well, that was uh, reserved for the worst of the worst non-Romans. It was the way that the Roman government would tell you and anybody watching, hey, you cross this line, you come up against Rome, you challenge Rome, and you just watch and see what will happen to you. And so when they did crucify these non-Romans, actually the way they did it is it would often be at this main intersection where the roads would come together in a very public place so that everyone could watch and they could see this person suffer and they could see them die. Now, the enemies of Jesus, they had been plotting his death for a long time. How were they going to arrest him? How were they going to capture him? How would they be done away with him? And so you see the political leaders, the religious leaders coming against him and trying to trap him in his words and the crowds preventing them from getting to him at times. And they tried on several occasions, but they couldn't get him. He's just too wise. He's able to outsmart him. But thanks to the betrayal of Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, they found Jesus alone on the Mount of Olives in the middle of the night. And they got him. It was, it was dark. Nobody knew what was going on. And quickly they parade Jesus from one place to the next place. It was this kangaroo court from religious leaders to political leaders. They each wanted to get this over with as fast as possible. And at the same time, none of them really wanted their fingerprints on what was about to happen. And so it took less than a day for this kangaroo court to pronounce Jesus guilty. And then his slow agonizing, horrific death would begin. He was turned over to the Roman soldiers, the Roman authorities, and he was tortured. They would blindfold him and then they would whip him and they would taunt him. Hey, Jesus, do you know who's whipping you now? Or uh, you're so smart, right? Who is the one giving you this beating? And they would mock him. Oh, prophet, just tell us who hit you. Then they would grab the hair of his beard by the fistful and rip it from his face. They would weave branches of thorns together and shove it down into his, uh, 
head, making this pretend crown so that it dug into his flesh. They beat him with a cat of nine tails. The cat of nine tails was a Roman whip, and the fringes of the whip were embedded with pieces of sharp glass and sharp stone, so that when the whip would hit against the person, it would claw into their flesh, and when the soldier would snap his wrist back, it would peel off chunks of flesh with each flick of the wrist. It was said that 40 lashes was enough to kill a man, so the Roman soldiers would often give 39. They put on Jesus' bare back the cross beam that he would be crucified on, and they tried to make him carry it all the way up the hill to the point of his place of execution. But from the torture, from the exhaustion of the day, from the loss of blood, from dehydration, from everything that was going on, Jesus' body couldn't handle it. It just collapsed. The man from the crowd was forced to come out and to carry the cross beam the rest of the way up. Jesus, he was dragged along up the hill. The soldiers, they took what amounted to railroad spikes and they drove it, they drove them through his wrists. They placed his feet one on top of another and they drove another spike right through his ankles, nailing him to the cross. Then they would put the cross up and they would erect the cross so that it sat up on the hill. When they picked the cross up and they dropped it into place, that thud would have forced Jesus' shoulders out of joint. His collarbone likely would have collapsed. He would have struggled just to breathe and he would spend the next several hours just with each breath pushing himself up and then back down. With each breath, it would be agonizing pain. Each breath, any word he would say would be said in complete agony, in total pain. There would be blood stripping down his face, blood from his wrists and his ankles all pooling at the bottom of the cross. And with all of this, Jesus spoke. This is the context in which he spoke these seven words, these seven sayings, these seven conversations. Now, if you could speak, what would you have said first? What would you have prayed first? Would you complain about how unfair the treatment was, how they got it all wrong, how you didn't deserve this, how this wasn't right? You've done nothing for this type of treatment. Would you have looked out to your friends or family, loved ones there? Would you have just said a a note of love toward them so they would remember how much you cared about them? Would you have prayed for strength? God, I'm trying to do your will here. Will you give me the strength to do exactly what you've called me to do? Will you help me get through this? What would you have said? You know, none of those things are the way that Jesus began the conversation. The first thing Jesus prayed, when Jesus looked out and he saw the Roman soldiers who, were, who had done all this to him, when he heard the voices of the religious leaders who had put this farce of a trial together and come up with this crazy legal prosecution, he, when he looked out and he saw the tears of his friends and those who dared to stay close and defend him, what does Jesus say? He talks to his father, and it's a very intimate quiet conversation. And he says, Dad, here's my request. Here's what I'm asking you to do. Will you forgive them? Will you forgive them? They don't really know what they're doing. Will you forgive them? This is my plea from the cross. Forgiveness. Forgiven. They don't know what they're doing. See, understand this. Even in moments when you don't know what you've done, Jesus' first word to you is forgiven. That's his first word, even when you don't realize it. And in that horror, when you do understand exactly what you've done and the wrong choices you've made and just how wrong it is, Jesus' words to you then are the same. It's forgiven. It's the first word of the conversation. It's where the conversation begins. It's that place where you and I, we can't say anything. We can't do anything to try to earn any type of forgiveness. Why? Jesus has to do it, and he's done it all for us. You are forgiven.
He says this before they repent. He says this before there's any confession, when the Roman soldiers are still in the middle of this whole crucifixion, when the religious leaders are all chuckling together that they finally got him before they understood and realized just what they have done. It's where the conversation starts. It starts with forgiveness. And we simply have to experience God's forgiveness. We experience God's forgiveness. That's really our job. Now, you remember the story of the lost son, the prodigal son? You remember how that one goes? Uh, you remember the lost son, he, was, he goes up to his dad and he basically tells his dad, Hey dad, you're dead to me, can I go ahead and have my inheritance now? And the father, he allows the son to make that choice and he says, Alright, here's the money and so the son goes and he squanders all his wealth and all this wild living. He ends up with the pigs and for a Jewish guy to end up with the pigs, you know things have gone terribly wrong. And so while he's in the pigsty eating what the pigs are eating, he's thinking to himself, you know what? Even my dad's servants have it better than this. And so he decides he's going to come home. And as he's on his way home, he's memorizing this speech and he's rehearsing it in his mind over and over and over again. When I get there, I'm going to tell my dad, dad, I know I've sinned against you. I've sinned against heaven. Will you just make me like one of your servants? Well, as he's going, as he's saying this speech over and over and over in his mind, you remember what happens? As he approaches, the father has been scanning that horizon day after day, day after day, day after day, hoping that one day his son will emerge. And here comes that familiar figure. Oh, maybe he looks a little more hunched over now, but there he is, and the father knows it. The father sees the son. And we miss just the hilarity of this situation and the cultural implications of it and what's going on here because it's a little different for our society in our society. In that society, in that culture, men never ran anywhere. They wore these uh, men of standing. They wore these nice, long, dignified robes and you did not run. You especially did not run to a son who said, hey dad, you're dead to me. No, what you did to a son like that was turn your back to him. But this is not what the father does. The father, he gathers up his robes, carries them, and sprints toward his son. And before his son can even get a word out, the father embraces the son. He hugs him. He, he kisses him. And then the son tries to go through his speech. Father, I've sinned against you. I've sinned against heaven. Just make me like one of your servants. And do you remember what the father said to the son? He didn't say anything at all. He, he didn't even address that. No, he calls his servants over. He says, hey, servants, prepare a banquet. I, I need you to bring a royal robe, put it on my son, bring uh, the, the, the signet ring so I can put it on his finger, put some sandals on his feet. Why? Because the son of mine who was lost is found. The son who is dead is alive. See, so understanding the story? The father, he'd forgiven his son a long time ago. Long before the son ever made the first step in the journey to return home, the father had already forgiven the son. What did the son have to do? He just had to experience the forgiveness that the father was already offering. The experience that the father had already extended. And you know, the same thing's true for me and you. Before we ever make a move to the father, Forgiveness has already been extended. The question is whether or not we're going to experience that forgiveness. You know, many of the soldiers, many of the religious leaders, they were forgiven, but they never experienced that forgiveness. And so what happens is they remain trapped in their sin. And you know, what's that, and you know what that's like. Because we all know people who are trapped in their sin. Maybe, maybe you have a lost son, a prodigal son or daughter who's kind of ran away. They're doing their own things. They've strained all the relationships. They're engaged in all this wild living, doing whatever it is they want to do, separated from their family. And you as a parent, you're aching, you're hurting, but you've already forgiven them. Forgiveness has already been extended, but they're not experiencing it yet. Why? Because they're still doing whatever it is they want to do. And so the relationship remains strained or maybe even non-existent at all. Maybe you've been in a marriage like that 
where there's been some argument, something, and there's been this blow up, and now there's a separation. There's not speaking. They're not on good terms. The marriage is not in a good trajectory. And so what happens, maybe one spouse is offering forgiveness and say, hey, let's just, I'm, I'm, I forgive you. Let's make this happen. But the other one is still living in denial or making excuses or just ignoring the whole thing, doing whatever they want. And so the relationship remains unhealed. See, forgiveness is offered before repentance or confession ever takes place. Now, to, to enjoy that forgiveness, you have to go to the person you've wronged. And that's part of what repentance is, is you go to the person you've wronged. You got to go to your spouse. You got to go to your parents. You have to go to your children. You have to go to your friends, whoever it is. Whoever you've wronged, you have to go to that person. And it's the same way with God. In order to enjoy the forgiveness that he's offering, you have to go to God. You have to acknowledge your sin. That's part of repentance. The other part of repentance is demonstrating that you are repentant. And when you're repentant, what, what, you would do anything to make it right. You know, when you've really wronged someone, you would do anything to make it right. And you get this principle of restitution throughout the scriptures. It shows up in Exodus and Leviticus. In the New Testament, you see it in Matthew and elsewhere. You go to the person that you've wronged. And as much as you can, you try to make things right. And in making things right and trying to earn that restitution, it's, uh, it's not that you're earning forgiveness. You're simply demonstrating that you truly are repentant, that you really feel bad about your sin and how you've wronged this person. You know, the same thing's true with God. When we're repentant, when we really feel bad about how we've sinned against God, we turn to him, we go to him, and then this change of mind results in this change of action where we're now saying, okay, God, now I give my life to you. What are you calling me to do? This is what repentance results in. Repentance always results in actions. Your actions don't earn forgiveness. They simply demonstrate that you are repentant. And so that becomes the question. Do your actions demonstrate repentance? Do your actions demonstrate repentance? Because it's real easy to say, I'm sorry, and then continuing to live life however it is you want to live. No, to, to do the hard work of repentance, to say, I'm sorry, whatever it takes, I'm going to make things right. But when you do that hard work, this beautiful thing happens. It results in deeper relationships. There's this peace of mind. There's this peace of heart. There's this joy, even in hard circumstance. It's the work of repentance that actually produces the fruit that we all want. And you know, that's interesting because that's exactly what John the baptizer says as he's leading people to follow Jesus. He says, produce fruit in keeping with repentance. But how do I know you're repentant? Well, you're doing actions that produce fruit that demonstrate repentance. The, the word repentance, the Greek word for it is metanoia. Metanoia, what that means is a change of mind that results in a change of action so that everything is congruent, that everything lines up. For instance, let's kind of walk through this a little bit with Peter. You remember Peter right before the cross? He sins, right? He denies Christ three times. I don't know the man. I don't know the man. I don't blinky blank know the man. Now, he's restored. He's repentant by that charcoal fire. Again, Jesus comes to him and Peter, he's, he's repentant. And how do we know he's repentant? Because he does the work that demonstrates his repentance. I mean, he goes and he lives as a missionary and he plants churches and he makes disciples and ultimately he dies for the cause of Christ. I mean, he demonstrates his allegiance doing whatever it takes to follow Christ. Now, if Peter simply would have said, hey, I'm sorry, but he wouldn't have demonstrated any of that work. If he had just gone on, just living however it is he wanted to live, what good would that have what good would that repentance have been? Nothing. How would anyone have known he was repentant? No one could have known. Why? It would have produced nothing. And that's never the point of repentance. Repentance always 
produces something. It produces a depth of relationship. It produces peace. It produces joy. It produces the fruit that, it, what, that we all want. Now, when we think of repentance, oftentimes we think of stopping, stopping a behavior. But when the Bible speaks of repentance, it's always stopping one behavior while at the same time starting something else. And that's why John the Baptizer's message is produce fruit in keeping with repentance. Okay, you're sorry, that's great, you're stopping this, but now you're developing this action that produces some fruit. It's the whole idea that we see in Ephesians that you put off something and you put on something else. Why? Because now you have this, you are a new creation, you're thinking differently, you're living differently. Uh, and you see it all over the place in Scripture. Uh, I want to give you a few examples. Therefore, having put aside all falsehood, let each of you speak truthfully with his neighbor. Okay, I'm putting aside any kind of lies, anything like that. I'm putting aside all falsehood. And now how am I going to speak? What am I putting on? How does this repentance change? Well, now I'm going to speak truthfully. Let the thief no longer steal, but let him labor doing honest work with his hands. Okay, you're no longer stealing. I'm putting off that behavior because I'm repentant. But at the same time, I'm putting on this new behavior of working hard, doing labor with my hands. Let no corrupt talk come out of your mouth, but only that which is building up, which gives grace to all who hear Okay, I'm not going to speak this way. I'm not going to tear down. I'm repentant, so I'm not doing that anymore. What am I going to do? Well, now I'm going to speak and I'm going to use words that build up, that encourage, that give grace to all who hear. Let all bitterness, malice, slander, and wrath be put away with you. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving others just as Christ forgave you. Again, I'm putting off all this bitterness, all this malice, all this slander, all these kind of wrong attitudes, wrong behaviors because I'm repentant. But at the same time, I'm putting on something else. Now I'm behaving in a different way. I'm loving each other. I'm tenderhearted and I'm forgiving others just as Christ forgave me. Now, how did Christ forgive us? That takes us back to the cross, doesn't it? And we see that here in this first conversation on the cross, that while we were still enemies of God, Jesus' first words to us are forgiven. He paid the price so that all who are willing to experience uh, his forgiveness, we get to escape the penalty of sin and we put away all the bitterness. Now we offer that same type of forgiveness to others. Even before the person comes to us and confesses, even before they repent, even before they understand how they hurt us, our first words ought to be forgiven. How does this happen? How do we live like that? Why? Because we're forgiven. And there's this change of mind that takes place. The Bible talks about us renewing our mind. And we renew our mind. So what does that produce? It produces right living. It produces a change of action because we're putting off one thing we're putting on something else that's what repentance looks like and that's how we get to enjoy the forgiveness that Jesus offers we forgive others just as Christ forgave us you know we've come to this first moment on the cross and I want you to imagine just for a moment that you're there, that you're with the crowd, that you've followed the whole scene of the day, and you've seen it all, and now you're gathered around the three crosses. You're one of those enemies too. You're, you're the ones throwing the stones. You're the one yelling the taunts, and you're, and you're seeing all of the grisly things that are taking place. What do you expect to hear? What do you expect Jesus' words to you are going to be when you are one of his enemies just in that situation? I don't think we hear what we expect to hear because Jesus' first words from the cross, the way he begins the conversation, he begins it with forgiven, that you can truly be forgiven. And you say, oh, Steve, you don't know what I've done. <laughs> I don't have to. I know what Jesus says. You're forgiven. 
You get to experience that forgiveness through true repentance where you go to God and then you say, hey, God, I'm going to do now what you've called me to do. I'm going to demonstrate that I am repentant. So what are you calling me to do? Let me study it. Let me learn it. Let me live it. And I'm going to offer this same forgiveness to others. You are forgiven. It's the first thing Jesus said. It's where the conversation starts. Heavenly Father, God, we can't even understand this. That while we were your enemies, while we would have been right there with the political leaders and the Roman soldiers and the religious leaders of the day taunting you, throwing rocks at you. And that's what we've done essentially with our lives in our sin before we had a relationship with you. That even in that moment, your first words to us are forgiven. Before we understand, before we realize, you say forgiven. God, help us to walk in that reality. Help us just to grasp hold of that. And God, more importantly, help us to then extend that same forgiveness to others as you call us to do. Why? Because we demonstrate that we are repentant and that we want to walk in that forgiveness, experiencing the joy and the depth of that relationship. To do that, we need your help because we're not people like that. So we ask this by the power of your Holy Spirit and the grace of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you for joining us this morning. We're so grateful you were able to join us online. We pray that this message was a blessing to you. We hope that it encouraged you and equip you even further so you can go out and live the life that Jesus has called you to live. To go out to share him and impact people. We love you. Have a blessed week. Come late.